Okay folks, so uh, today we are going to talk about relationship web and the importance of relationship in all aspects of semantics and semantic web. Um, do you have you guys you guys have any question based on what you have read so far? Um, any particular things you want me to cover? Of course, I'll cover a lot of things, but anything you want to reflect on, or shall I do it? Okay. So th this was a talk I gave at uh, ER two thousand and eight conference, um, and. Um, so the subtitle is Trailblazing, Analytics, and Competing for Human Experience. Um, let's look at the evolution of the web. Um, I, there are pieces of this I had talked to you about in my first class or second class. When we started the web, um, what we had was web of pages or web of documents. And the documents were manually created. And we would insert the links. And the links were manually embedded, and um, we would do navigations. We go from one link to another link. Then we started to have web of databases. So we figured out that we can put a program on server that can launch queries against database, get the results, and then um, you know create HTML on the fly. DHTML, other things that came, dynamic HTML in the early days. And you can see the results, query results on the fly. You can show a table that came from, um, you know, database, the rows, you know, rows and columns came from database and you could display that on the web. So the pages can be dynamically generated, driven by databases. Then there was a period where there was extensive work on web services and there is still web services are still used quite a bit um, and there were uh, W3C and others were involved in development of standard for web services so we have visual web services description language as what was called as heavy duty services and it will help you communicate in XML the data also the web's internal plumbing extensively change over from HTML to XML because more and more data you know pass from one server to another server right. and then there was a lighter weight version of web services that became very popular called RESTful services or REST services right. and that remains very popular even today um, as the services came, um, uh, it was you know quickly followed by what we call as mashups. So you'll be accessing databases and putting that res the results from the database, accessing database using web services, get the results and put the results on a uh, in a front end. Initially, for example, the front end may be uh, a map. <laughs> And uh, the very first uh, mashup that was created was a mashup that showed you houses were houses for sale and the prices. So you would have a map, a map quest or whatever map was popular at that time, and then you would put on the map, um, you know, on the location uh, using the database would have a field for location. Using that, you put that uh, data onto the map. And then came mashup, mashups where data came from multiple databases. An integration of the data happened on the front end. Right. Then um, we started to have what we call as web of people. So uh, social networks, user generated created content. There were also extensive group activities. For example, Gene Drift is where um, various biologists would annotate genomic data for sharing on the web. Okay. Annotate was a tool again for, I think applied also in biological or biomedical domain. And then, remember this slide, and in fact there's a version of slide that is probably, that goes back to 2005 or so, on the same slide. 
maybe if not earlier. And then um, we uh, at this part when this slide was created, it was quite bit, you know in the future. Uh, and uh, I said web of as an oracle. Oracle, you ask questions. Oracle gives you answer. It knows everything. Or assistant, or a partner. Ask the web using semantics to leverage text, data, services, and people. All different forms of information available on the web in you know various interface and such. And interestingly, about two years ago, this really started to happen. There was an earlier version. You might call Siri as one of the pioneers in that context, and that started. Um, uh, so this was again the slide present in 2008. So we had no idea, but uh, it happened very soon. Siri, and then now you can see a lot more is happening. So the agents or uh, you know bots are everywhere. So you know last year it was the hottest year for investment into bots for startups, and we'll see how they succeed or not succeed. Uh, in near future. So that's really happening. And ultimately what happens here is that uh, that leads to what I define as computing for human experience. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have a chance to give you a talk about computing for human experience, but there is a wiki page on our noises thing. Uh, there is an article that I published and there is a video also in my video on my home page uh, where I give a, um, uh, an invited talk at uh, the uh, Supercomputing Center at uh, University of Illinois and some other places. Uh, also had some keynotes on that topic. So you can look at more about that later on, which is a vision which I see quite re being realized. So, you know, in a few years uh, that I started talking about it. An interesting thing um, I want to point here out is uh, that um, the things are being structured in such a way that more and more non-technical people, our people get served in a non-technical, without any technological uh, involvement. So the whole idea about this assistance is that you can, um, you, know, you can talk to an agent by in, in your voice. You can send the agent an email. You can do the chat. Any form that is not normal uh, for human, with excellent. Um, progress in speech to text conversion and such, or speech and understanding, all of these things are, you know, variety of ways humans want to interact with the machines, that's starting to happen. I may mention um, a, a, very, a very influential article which I talked about a lot more in this context um, uh, called uh, Computing in the 21st Century uh, by um, Mark Weiser. Um, and he had a very you know, influential article in this context, um, talking about technology disappearing in the background, right? and humans. Uh, uh, so if you look here, early users of web, I started using web in uh, pretty early, I think, uh, 2002 maybe, or no, 1992 time frame. Um, and I started a project in 2000 and, it was 1993 which became commercial product in 1995. But in those days, we all needed some understanding of technologies. And only a few people in computer science and military had access to those things. And then more and more people, this was very important. Until now, we had a lot of you know, involvement. Uh, I mean, people need to, you know, at least people who are providing solution needed to know technology. But now, anybody could write a uh, social media blog in a post and they became all part of content creators and consumers together. Earlier there were separate people who were creators and other people who were consumers. So that, that is very interesting. And now everything is getting together. In those days we used to spend a lot of time and energy in data integration and interoperability. And even today it is not easy. Some things look pretty easy like when you take a database which has a location and you put on a map, it is very intuitive and very easy. But you take two databases and there is syntactic variations in the data and you have a lot of difficulties. And that is for that you need semantic. 
interoperability and integration and that makes for a challenging thing even today. So a compelling vision um, was presented, uh, it remains quite true today. I, I, I think all of you have read this paper because I really ask you to read this paper as you may think. So he says, uh, there is a quote, human mind works by association. With one item in its grasp, it snaps instantly to next that is suggested by the association of thoughts. And you know, our thoughts, you know, we can make an association with our work, like Monet is thinking about the sentiment thing that has to work tomorrow, and somebody else here is thinking about uh, something, you know, what, you know, what is my son doing right now? So, you know, we have different, you know, contexts instantaneously created in our mind, and we are able to go, um, you know, and chase any one of them, and then we come back, and you know, now you start paying attention to my what I'm saying here. That context switch is so powerful. We can do that, you know, so well in our brain. But it's something to learn from, right? Something to think about because that that really is um, uh, uh, gives us a blueprint of uh, some exciting work yet to be done. How our brain, um, you know, maintains multiple contexts and how it goes them keeps those contexts separate keeps those trails separate at at a, at at an instant i can be thinking of both my work and home right and that's that layering that ability to have multi you know multi tier and multi pull uh, you know the trails at the same time is very is quite possible for brain um, computers are learning going towards that, but I think, you know, still, we're still not there. We still have, all of these bots have to be specialized, typically speaking. And they're specialized with particular data that is used to train them, or particular database, they can access them, or particular set of people, human, human expertise that's available in answering. So for example, some of the bots, like the one that um, uh, Facebook uh, is developing, they realize that there's no way to train the bots ahead of the time. So they said, okay, will have some, you know, remember when you go to a website for uh, help, they have knowledge base and you start typing some question and they will match to question that is already in there where there is already canned answers by the system or by other uh, users and they display those answers saying, did this solve any of your problem? And if you go to, for example, a phone company's website and you have some problem, they will first almost insist that you check their, you know, um, you know, self-help uh, thing before you call them. They don't, you know, you to use their resources. Um, those systems have started to be uh, better as with the time goes along, and yet they are still not very satisfying. So Facebook decided that we are going to have a mix, automated, and um, you know, human. Siri, for example, is entirely done by, uh, you know, non-human bot while, you know, say, uh, Facebook said, well, our AI is not strong enough and I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, send the question. Uh, I don't know exactly the algorithm when they're using um, uh, machine versus man or human, but, um, uh, uh, but they, are, they are doing that. And the idea, I am guessing from whatever little they published or talked about, is that they'll capture uh, the whole workflow when a question comes from a user, and when a human solves the, you know, gives answer, they'll capture both the process of getting the data, where the data came from, and uh, the, the answer that seemed to have satisfied the user, right? So in accordance with some intricate web of trails carried out by the cells of brain. So this is something I have mentioned to you in this class before and or to some of you in, in side conversations. I think there is a slide based on a keynote on a similar topic, the relationship at the heart of semantics which I gave in 2002 soft sem conference. And the corresponding paper which I asked you to read is 2004, but that was a paper written in, uh, at, you know, as we were invited, the, the, as a keynote speaker, I was invited to write that paper, and that's what that paper you saw. So at that point, we start. We talked about uh, relation in this keyword entities relationship. 
and the counterpart of that which others have used like Amit Singhal in 2012 blog use uh, things not strings but it's exactly the same so those are strings these are things um, and we had talked about relationship long time ago, but now more and more people are going towards that. So, for example, a good bit of work at Google and other places is saying, well, we achieved some level of things in entities. And that's what you saw in semantic search and knowledge graph and infobox. Now they are moving towards that. Okay. We continue in our group, we continue to do some pioneering work to some extent. Um, Kalpa's work, let's say, on summarization saying what when you say property that's those are simple form of relationship right you have an entity and say i have so much space and what five properties would give you the most comprehensive and complete information or and, and relevant information that's the question he's asking right that's an attempt to take you know related you know information related to the entities and enriching those entities with some property values properties and their values. In longer term, we can do a lot more. For example, semantic associations we'll talk about. Right? Or if you answer the question that I had, what is Rho? Right? Rho is semantic association. That's the name we gave. Came up for 2002 paper. In parallel then, what happens is that with the keywords or strings, we will get, you will do search and you get the data. With entities, you get more information, and you can you you to do that you have to have some level of integration. And with relationships, you can get further on. You can analyze things, insights, and knowledge. Right. So when I try to say something using, you know, about these elections, and I give you a sentiment graph or emotion graph, we are giving this here and there's some form of relationship in this case predefined kind of relationship in terms of the emotion expressed as an example that's a beautiful quote there an object by itself is intensely uninteresting came up or found that and i used it so object by itself is intense uh, intensely uninteresting you can take this thing and call anything but it is the thing that this is related to in your mind the functions that it has, properties it has, usage it has, application it has, that is what gives meaning to it. Not what, you know, you can call it mug or you can call it cup or whatever you call it. Right? That whole picture in your mind of what this thing is, that picture is possible only because you are exploiting, utilizing relationships. These are this as an entity has nothing, no value. It's because of the relationship that you understand what it is. Right? So, so the name Amit Shah has no value. It is all the association that you will have with it that gives you the value, whatever that is. So, um, semantics and relationship on a web scale what we are, you know, so doing, and you know, what I was talking about in 2008 here, but and before, is that we are increasing. There is increasing depth and sophistication in dealing with semantics, from searching to integration to analyze, analysis, insight, discovery, and decision making. Right? In abstract, in in you know, at the end of the day. Search is really something that is easier to do and we do it toward and it, it is a path towards what we want. If you, if you sit back and, and, and reflect, nobody cares about search per se. It's simply a vehicle for you to get either information or insights necessary for you to take an action or make a decision. It is being able to make the decision or take action that is what matters. The action may be you want to influence somebody on the web. Right? Your action could be that 
I have decided that so and so would is ahead in the election. Is that you are interested? If you do search, typical search would bring with a lot of documents. And then you look at the documents, you read the documents, you analyze in your brain, and then you get to the uh, decision or you get the uh, right insight so you can make an action like you want to know how the stock is doing and what people are saying about the stock and then make a decision whether you should dump that stock in your portfolio or not right and um, the whole idea then is that we want to reduce that effort that human has to make and make the computer smarter intelligent so the whole holy grail about this AI and the whole thing about using AI for chat box, what is it? You can use chat box today, some, to ask for a reservation at a hotel, at a, hotel, at a, at a restaurant. Right? It is the reservation that you're interested in, not the whole process to get in the relation uh, thing. Right? So that is the movement that you're seeing. And that requires uh, the systems become more intelligent. Right. When you say the system require, has to become more intelligent, by itself system can never be totally intelligent. System has to, to become intelligent, you have to understand the user. So if, you know, um, uh, Amir wants to reserve a, a rest restaurant to take money out for something, or Manas wants to, you know, make a reservation for something, you, you know, the, the good answer is possible only if you understand your users. So if you, if you, if you see uh, our talk, uh, the, I, I've been talking about giving keynotes on this smart data. We particularly talk about the contextual information processing and personalized information. You know, K-Health, that's a very major thing. So thus, typically, the intelligence that I didn't cover here, but I, I think I'm making a side comment here. The intelligence is never going to come by itself by making, giving a machines a lot of knowledge. The intelligence is going to come, will require that you understand the user. Right? And that you actually understand the, uh, you know, you personalize it. Systems like um, uh, Google search have done a pretty good job in personalizing the search, right? So, for, because it has extensive log of all the queries you have made to the extent that you are willing to, uh, you know, your, if you log on to your Google account and then do search, it's going to utilize all the context it has built up in, the, in terms of your prior search. And the fact that you click for that keyword, you clicked on this, for that keyword typing, you actually had three uh, words that you used and all that knowledge in building the search term to what you might click on is utilized, is captured somehow, typically as vectors and uh, you know, it gives you a thing. So that is about search. But if you go uh, more, uh, you know, where you want machine to understand, because search by itself has to understand you only so much. Search assumes that the results will be processed by you when you look at the documents. Right? Search means that it, the idea of search is to give you good documents that likely has the information you want. But it itself does not have the job of giving you a processed you know, thing or insight that you can immediately decide upon. Search may help you find what airline choices you may have. But itself is nothing, you know, not, not nothing to do with what airline would be the best for you with your own concern about frequent flyer mileage and, and affili affiliation, money you want to spend, day of the time you want to leave the airport or arrive at the airport. Right? Today's search engines, in, or including travel search engines, have a very hard time to meet my needs because there is an interplay going on between 
I don't want to reach a foreign country at 3 a.m. I was going to Tehran. And I said, I want to leave, you know, at the time that I would typically be awake. And I don't want to reach there where it is a night there in a foreign country. You know, so I want to reach there after 7 a.m. And I want to leave here during the day, right? Uh, I don't want to uh, take a 3, 2 a.m. flight. What do I, what do I do by going, you know, am I going to drive to airport at, you know, midnight? I don't want to do that. So, that is there, combined with the cost, combined with certain airline, combined with the total time of travel, and I, I have no fixed formula of which is more important. Sometimes the price difference is $500, I am willing to undergo some level of you know, uh, trouble or take a two hours longer flight if I'm going to save $500. But if I'm going to save $100, I would say, I'll spend $100 more if I'm getting better time. But everybody's different. So somebody else for exactly the same, you know, uh, itinerary uh, that, you know, a ticket that he has to buy or she has to buy will make a different, different, different choice. Getting that in the system is very hard. Coming here, um, for all that higher level of intelligence, we have to explicitly pay attention to relationships. So though the, the, in my view, in my, my, my mindset, and I, 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 I not, um, not everybody would agree, not all the AI researchers will agree uh, with me, without thinking about relationship, you are not going to go anywhere. So however smart statistical system you're going to build, there will be some value, you will get somewhere, but nowhere close to human intelligence and actionable things. Right? You'll get quite a far ways, let's say if you want to do search, but you'll not get that far, away, far if you are going to help me buy the ticket in action that I'm going to take. And there is a distinction because there is a specificity, you know, in terms of travel durations, a frequent flyer affiliation, cost, convenience, all of those things need to be explicitly thought about and understood so that I can do trade offs of them. And that is something no deep learning system or no statistical system can do. It can do things in the sense that what a majority of people would do or what people have done based on my corpus. And yet that may not be applicable to me. Right? Because, you know, if somebody says, I'm not paying for it, my host is paying for it, I don't care about how much it costs. But if somebody says, I'm going to pay for this thing from my own pocket, I'm not going to. Or says somebody in the middle saying, my, you know, professor wants to spend limited amount of funds, not everything, so I have to be somewhere in the middle, right? Okay, and so relationship, now, so relationships are at the heart of semantics and um, I have discussed, um, if you uh, if you went to the library page and read the abstract of that paper, 2004 paper, there is a phrase about semantics, read that very carefully. We need to continue to progress from syntax to structure to semantics. There's another uh, paper in 2008 from system to syntax to structure to semantics. Has, a, has somebody read it? Well, I think there's a paper worth reading, right? From system to syntax to structure to semantics. So here is a, um, uh, there's a little paper we did, article we did in IT for Internet Computing. Relationship web takes you away from which document could have data or information I need to interconnecting web of information embedded resources to give you knowledge, insights, and answers I seek. That's one way of phrasing with this term relationship web, right? A web in which relationships are explicitly understood and utilized.
so this is, I think, a, an interesting visualization to have. It kind of simplifies, but yet covers a lot of grounds. What you see here is, um, you know, all kinds of um, data. So your structure, text. In this case, I'm. Uh, yeah, okay, this is not limited, so I can show you the same version, the different version of the slides which is specialized, uh, which, which focuses on healthcare data or clinical or biomedical. Structured text like literature, informal text like social network data, multimedia content and other web data, and web services. Right? You can invoke that with something and then you get the response for that. There's all these variety of things available and some more. And these are all data for me. Then I have no models. They have different words, right? We went through vocabulary, ontology, knowledge base, knowledge graph, domain model, right? And models can be even user model. Right? So you have some models, and typically, at the minimally, they would capture the vocabularies, the terms that you would use. So that they are consistently applied here. Right? So there may be a, a very you know you, you if you if you again if you pay attention to syntax st uh, structure semantics you'll be able to ask question. But suppose I have note that says orange. Then the good thing would be that you can find orange here and you can find orange here, and then you can say ah. There are different, you know, the orange here is a tag of a, whatever is the orange. And orange here may be just the word orange. And at least you can say now that there are very different artifacts, in manifestations, because this may be pixel versus string, and that they are related. So I get some level of relationship, but I'll have to distinguish between, if you want to go to semantic, that vocabulary of orange by is not itself enough, you may have to say orange color or orange fruit, which will be different, or orange, uh, you know, as in uh, company in Europe. And then, based on that, there will be semantic saying that this orange is the same as this orange. It is, you know, the match is semantic level, not syntactic level. So re that, that then brings you to the richness of the model. Right? Richer the model, more accurate meaning <coughs> and understanding of the data you will have. This is semantic proximity, right? Proximity. Yeah. Semantic proximity is just is a is a measure of how similar two things are. So there are many terms used in the literature, semantic similarity, semantic dis, uh, distance, semantic um, proximity, uh, semantic relatedness. Many of these people have used over the period of time. Um, I had used the term and introduced the term semantic proximity in my so far yet so near paper, so far schematically yet so near semantical paper, 1992, uh, in where I gave a keynote on that topic. And there, the novelty of the semantic proximity was that it explicitly realized uh, domain because in each domain the word may have different thing. In technology domain, Apple would typically mean the company apple in uh, you know uh, food domain apple would mean food domain uh, apple right then i had context then i had model and abstractions for example is there a uniform uh, there are multiple uh, uh, inter you know uh, um, meaning and usage of patronomy is that used consistently so typical operators on data or aggregation, summation, whatever those are, right? And then data itself. 
So I think for this was the first effort that clearly said that these relationships, uh, the two, uh, the thing that says how related are two objects, must incorporate the domain and modeling and the abstractions. And it is not, you know, without that you can't accurate. So that is what, before that all the, um, you know, uh, models, all the definitions and proposals and papers on semantic similarity and distances did not explicitly account for those things. So, when you use those, uh, you know, the, that those models and the data and then do extraction, metadata extraction, information extraction, semantic annotations, all those things, terms, they mean the same or related things, right? Then you get a structured representation and a preferably semantic representation of the data. So now you have taken away the system differentiations, you have taken away the syntactic differentiations, you have taken away the structured differentiations and you are able to deal with semantics. Because here these nodes have the clear interpretation in your models or ontologies or noise graphs. There is another interesting thing hap that happens, right? And this is very important. This is where uh, I've been, you know, uh, encouraging you guys to think about, um, uh, uh, you know, incorporating knowledge in statistical techniques. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, recently you saw my paper, Paren or Zeni or Pedro Dominguez or all these other guys. They were also talked about, machine learning guys also talked about the need for knowledge. That is the knowledge, right? And um, uh, there are many ways you may do information extraction, including machine learning, rule-based machine learning, uh, you know, NLP, whatever that you do. Another interesting thing that happens here is that at this level, what what starts to happen is that you are you are benefiting from two things. What is it that what what is in the data in whatever form or syntax it is, a already known knowledge that is modeled in my knowledge graph or ontology. So it is possible that I identify, you know, a person here, right? I suppose I say I identify here a person, Shweta, and then I have Shweta here, right? So there is a home page of Shweta and there is Shweta here. And then I have knowledge base like DBLP or Google Scholar, which has all the papers of that Shweta has. This was not about Shweta. Uh, this, the, the here, let's assume for the sake of discussion that this uh, is a, you know, a paragraph on Shweta. And it doesn't say all the papers Shweta has written. But that could be a knowledge base where other papers on, you know, that Shweta has written are there. So here, I am saying I got the Shweta, but this Shweta is same as that, and other knowledge from that can be immediately incorporated here in my understanding. That is the power. You see, this, this is, we are able to add things. Machine learning has two things, right? What is in the data? And what you are telling machine learning through training. If you do supervise or semi-supervised thing, right? Now think about it. What can you convey? What is the information content? What is the knowledge? What, what, how, what is the richness of what you can convey through training? Only thing you can convey through training is something related to your set classification. Your classification, your positive on Hillary, negative on Hillary, positive on Trump, negative on your classes. And only thing you will convey as part of your annotation process is that predefined categorization. But there is no limitation of the richness of the model. 
so here i could you know put in whatever thing i want including all of hillary's position statements right and it's not limited you know so the, rich, the so using knowledge base where you know and associating that with this metadata or semantic annotation is far richer than what you can do as a process of classification even when it's a human annotation involved so do you call this process semantic association no, uh, so okay, our use of semantic association is, uh, uh, you know, the, in the context of what is described as a row or creating a path. I'm associating this node. When I do connection this node to this, to this, there is semantic association between this and this. And that is described by the path definition. And that we call semantic association. Like, for example, Schwitter's uh, publications, is this considered an example of association or not? Not yet uh, in the form that we define, and uh, because we were the first one to use, uh, to my knowledge, the word semantic association, that has become more like a definition. So uh, I think if you if you do search, uh, you probably will find that uh, the semantic association word has been used in many different domains, but in the computer science domain, and particularly information part of the computer science domain. So I can't talk about uh, you know programming languages and other things like that. But when you talk about information systems, including web and other things like that, uh, our definition of semantic association, the row operator, is uh, the first one. So that became, I think that is a, that is a defect of standard. Right? But um, so I'll come to that. But we have so a slide, so semantic association. This is semantic annotation, but I want to point out very interesting artifact that most people have not talked about. If you look at the Tali papers and Symagic's papers, we talk about semantic enrichment. So here in the document, let's say I found, uh, you know, um, Zagreb. And then, in, in two, you know, we are talking about in, in two, year 2000. And then I would say, oh, that, I have knowledge base, that is, that is a city in Yugoslavia. And so I say Zagreb because Yugoslavia here. That is semantic enrichment. There is no mention of Yugoslavia here. Or I say, um, uh, you know, um, Amit Sheth here, and that's his professor, and here you say Professor Amit Sheth. That's enrichment. I can do with that. I can take whatever they want. The, we have two options. One is that when I explicitly take additional knowledge from the knowledge base or knowledge model ontology, to add to the metadata, I call it semantic enrichment. But other alternative I have is, because everything is linked, when I have, I model something here, I say that is defined as in that node there. Then I can dynamically pull in whatever knowledge I want when I come here. So, for example, I would say, I, uh, I, I'm talking about, let's say, um, you know, there's a nearby, uh, uh, you know, uh, town here called Springfield. Not too far from here, right? That's Springfield, Ohio. There are at least 13 Springfields in the United States. Right? So, technically those 13 will be there. And when you, uh, you know, uh, bring in cement, you know, Springfield here, even if this does not mention Ohio, you may say Springfield, Ohio. And then you'll have a link to Springfield, Ohio. And Springfield, Ohio has a hospital name XYZ. Now that is available to you because you would have linked to that node and that is all the associated knowledge. Interesting point is that such a thing, what I'm describing here, comes to our human brain naturally. It doesn't take any effort. We instantaneously relevant knowledge will be applied. We are still uh, in an early phase of doing this thing. Some of us in semantic sphere and, and who has understood the power of knowledge have thought about this and are working on this. 
but we, by by and large we are at a uh, early stage of doing all of these things together and that's why i think is significant that what we have been talking about and what some others are talking about is that we need to use powerful techniques that work with a lot of data like machine learning and deep learning and we need to use powerful techniques that work with uh, known knowledge and derived knowledge from different diverse sources and when you combine together we get a very uh, powerful uh, system right that takes us a little bit closer to uh, to you know kind of human brain capability at our level now once we have all this i can do a lot of things i can do search or semantic search i can do integration get data from multiple sources and combine and create a you know report where something comes from here something comes from here something comes from here i can do analysis like i could say what is the i can ask the question what is uh, uh, you know the sentiment on hillary clinton in ohio versus utah an analysis can bring in well what does it mean you know what is the data in utah what is the data you know what what is ohio i multiple ways if i were to you know look at geospatial stuff i would say give me all the uh, data all the tweets that have geo location plus give me all the tweets where in the profile the name of the town or city belongs to that state right yeah that is a semantic integration analysis combined you could do discovery much better because you can take fragments from uh, so one very powerful uh, form of discovery is undiscovered public knowledge so there scientific paper that talks about this scientific paper talks about this scientific paper talks about this and you get all of them together and you do now semantic association you link them together create either a path or a subgraph that's the work that delroy did right so um, you know a uh, very influential work in this area was in 1987 there is a person named dr swan swanson in illinois who uh, manually read the literature and found information on magnesium and migraine and what produces stress and combined together and made a discovery he did not do any scientific experiment he simply took different scientific experiments carefully aligned the you know findings from each of them and stitched them together this is what called semantic this came from here this came to here but you have to be careful that they are in the same context that what is here and what is here actually applies to the same kind of subject or same kind of situation otherwise if you link them up in a you know the in a different context then it will give you totally wrong you know discovery right so when he brought this thing he made 11 or 13 discovery like that so it called, it's called undiscovered public knowledge because this information somehow public but nobody put them together so but we can do that we can do question answering which is being is done quite a bit these days so let's uh, you know and there was a question about relationships uh, you know uh, issues in relationships so here are some of the issues when you think about relationships just a pedagogy if you have to write a, uh, a let's say survey article or a tutorial then you have to create some taxonomy like that so here i am doing something about talking about relationships so i say here are the issues i am going to address understanding and modeling relationship identifying relationship meaning extracting it that there exists a relationship in this data discovering a exploring relationship i have some pieces of things i am bringing them all together so i am doing reasoning connecting the things from multiple sources or taking it one step beyond what is already known in response inferencing and reasoning hypothesizing and validating complex relationship using an exploring relationship for various semantic applications search querying analysis insight discovery right 
right? So these are all the different ways to think about relationship and all the, you know, uh, in, to get a full understanding or broader understanding of what relationships are about. So, um, let's look at some of the questions you might ask. What? What thing or which particular one? Who? What or which person or persons? Where? At or in what place? When? At what time? How? In what manner or ways? By what means? Why? What purpose, reason or cause? With what intention, justification, motive? These are just sample of the things people try to convey through data or is captured in data. And now ask this question and pay attention to the state of art in so-called information extraction field. Much of it in the past was related to entity identification and NER, name entity recognition, right? And entity linking. And then relationships, some relationships. But in reality, there is a lot more. So the field of information extraction still has a lot more to go because the data often conveys a lot more than just simply talk about relationship or entities and relationship. Additionally, the uh, type of data, so in the context of our, uh, you know, Archive for Health project, we are interested in clinical notes, we are interested in biomedical texts, we are interested in uh, web forums, we are interested in tweets, in microblogs. Yes? Can you give your insight about that information extraction? You said there is a lot to go. I mean, can you give us... Yeah, there's a lot to go. So, for example, in our own research, right, in this uh, project, uh, we, we have kicked off, uh, um, uh, if you think about uh, typical API for information extraction, right? So, you uh, use, you know, API Alchemy, which is acquired by IBM. There's API, um, what is it called? A, 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 a Open Calais. Calais. Open Calais, mm -hmm. right? There's another one starting with Z, Z, Z uh, that's Zamanta. Okay. These are all APIs, right? Now, you give the API some text and they will identify. What what, what are the things they give you? Sentiment. They give you entities. They typically give you sentiment. This is the standard. Emotion. I hope you use emotion. No, I also give emotion. They did? Really? Yeah. Same sort of, sort of emotion that we did because I didn't know. Then there is intention, then there is time, there is location, but basically all of the, any one of these can be talked about, right? For example, uh, uh, I don't think anybody did, um, uh, you know, intention of the form that Ashutosh defined in his thesis. So, so what the, the, what is what we are going to see is that increasing richness of metadata that we will create with increasing quality, with more relations type relationships. Because you see what happens here is that um, take Alchemy API or or Open Kale, give it some healthcare text. There's no way it's going to find healthcare related relationship, right? For example, uh, symptom or con medical condition, and um, and um, you know uh, symptom and uh, medical condition. Let's say there is a relationship between them. So, for example, UMLS has several relationship types. Now, traditional, you know, current generation, state of the art in. Um, uh, you know, information extraction doesn't give you domain specific relationships. So, one progress would be to um, uh, give you domain specific relationship. How will that happen? Practically all large companies uh, are involved in developing their knowledge graphs. So, initial knowledge graph may be built on 
DVPedia and Yago and Wikipedia, right? That's everybody, everybody uses Wikipedia for their knowledge graph. And then Google will hire a lot of people and they have really scaled up somewhat. But, um, uh, you know, there's, they, they are still at an early stage of making progress in building, um, you know, rich knowledge graphs in different domains. They are, they, are, they, are, they are pretty smart people, so I'm sure they know UMLS and I'm sure they're going to incorporate not, you know, UMLS. So, do you remember in the context of semantics and Thali, you give us a text and we will first use classification to uh, identify domain. And then you do domain specific extraction, right? The current state, you know, I think what one, one uh, 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 you know, expectation is that these um, information extraction tools like OpenKLA and others will move towards that lay, uh, frame, uh, that, that area. Um, you, you remember recently I shared a, um, uh, a, a, a uh, you know, a news item where they had integrated six large knowledge bases, right? Kanotea or what, what is it? No, so what is it called? It starts with C. You remember that? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. So, so, so now that knowledge graph arguably is larger than Wikipedia, Wikipedia, Yago and all that because it's... Huh? Cognato. Mm. So that is, that is one step. With that, more relations types will also be there. With it, it need a lot of, but extraction of them is very hard. With more work, more training, more, you know, you, you think, uh, you know, I'll go, I'll go, you know, more work on that, they will be able to work, uh, identify some of the relationship. At the same time, they will start building different, um, you know, things in different knowledge. Or like us, we decided that we are not going to play that game. We will only focus on healthcare today. So we are going to build, you know, knowledge graph for health. When we build knowledge graph for health, as we build knowledge graph, we have all those relationships types that are specific to the healthcare. So we are going to try and look for identifying relationships that are relevant to healthcare. So it's a, it's a question of contextualizing your, your information extraction, right? Yes, uh, doing more domain specific uh, extractions. And that will be made possible by, uh, you know, advances in creating large knowledge graphs. Because it's an expensive work. A lot of people have to work for a period of time before you build a good quality knowledge graph. Things keep on changing, keeping up to date is not easy. Plus, you have to continue work on your machine learning and other techniques that would you know, be used to improve the extraction for those entity types, relationship types. You're not only really identifying entity, you're type, type, trying to say uh, you know, um, the type of entity. So if you look at the example in our uh, you know, work which had in the previous work where we had on lexical, lexicontological, ontological and rule based extraction, then we were able to identify uh, anti, you know, uh, object called two fluid arms. But then, is it two fluid arms of fluid, body fluid removed, or two fluid arms of uh, medication you are taking? Right? Those are very relevant medical contexts, and being able to say that is very important. Right? Just two fluid arms is not very interesting. I mean, it would not give you much what, of what you need for. I mean, Two freedoms of what? So you, you go in along that line and make, you know, you know get more, more interesting extractions. Right? So what would happen is that there are pe some people like us who will do something in uh, this area, others may work on financial technologies and financial services thing, others may work from real estate or whatever. So they'll be continuing um, enhancement of domain independent information extraction tools with larger knowledge, knowledge base and more typing and relationships of generic type versus um, uh, progress on domain specific ones and then they will all come together hopefully okay. so so it's, it's possible that big company like Google can acquire company in healthcare information extraction company in financial service information company in this thing, some they may build it on their own and at the end they will have very broad coverages.
of course in academia we would not have the bandwidth and you know uh, resources to build that wider scope so but we can fill uh, you know in one of those domains and do very well there okay okay so let's see if we should take a break here uh, and uh, so th there is other, uh, you know, uh, Tom Ramesh had used the word event web, um, a web in which each node is an event or object and connected to other nodes using linguistic relationships, referential links such as href, links with metadata such as mref, which I defined in 1996, uh, link referring to the model, model reference, for example, model reference in Swasdal, SA, REST, as well as SSN, semantic sense networking. We use that same thing. By the way, all of these things came from our group. Swasdal came from our group. We first defined what is called as Visual S, which happened to be Mina's most cited uh, paper right now. I, I think maybe they may have changed. Uh, it had more than five citations. Um, SNS also came from my group and I, you know, I uh, led my students to work on that and, uh, uh, and uh, SSN came really from our semantic sensor, sensor web, we were the first one to really talk about it and then uh, I instigated the creation of the group and, group and then that's how it happened. So we had an idea sometime but to get a broader buy-in we will make it a community process, that's how we work it. So. But you can see by the way, in all of these things, uh, our students benefited a lot. So for example, for Swasdal, um, I think it was uh, uh, Kartik Kunal and Kartik Gomadam and uh, to some extent Ajit Ranava who worked on it. For SRS, Ajit Ranava who and Kartik Gomadam worked on it. For SSN, uh, Cory Hansen worked on it. Right? So and it is interesting, you can see that a same intuition per se, which we have had for a long time. The intuition was simply this. This picture has intuition. The intuition is that you're connecting this to that, to give this. So as a wisdom and as a, uh, as a rest have to deal with services of different kinds. SSN has something to do with uh, sensor data. I had also uh, done some work uh, on uh, semantic notation of other mi multimedia media types kind of thing. So we had a bunch of uh, work on uh, uh, you know multimedia related uh, thing. Then uh, okay, and then uh, okay, uh, yeah, you saw you saw this, you saw this. Then there are structural links showing spatial and temporal relationships. There are causal links. And there are relational links giving similarity or you know, relational, uh, you know, uh, models that uh, of the, of the, there's a lot of work in the you know in that relational model, and uh, you know finding any those kind of relationships. <coughs> so you can see now the the broad type of relationship. Partly they relate on the type of data involved. Clearly, you're not going to have linguistic relationship on image data, but some cases you would have multiple of these things. On this we do OCR, then we would have textual relationship on a... If it's a text, uh, image of a text, yeah, but if it's not image of a face, then... If he has a talk. <laughs> okay, uh, then um, in the real world, objects and events uh, represent or model real world, and there, you can have, again, this we might call domain specific uh, uh, and more complex relationship, for example, in the context of living organisms, you have these kind of things. These are all, yeah, in the living organism, there are all these kind of relationships. They are, they are medical terms and they are particular meaning. They are relationship of sorts. So if I'm, you know, really trying to understand, um, uh, uh, you know, certain kind of biological um, literature, 
then I'll have to pre understand this kind of relationship. And then the relationship between humans, like brother and sibling and father and child and friend, right? All this human relationship, right? So, um, those are the things. So, here is an example. What you see here on the top is a schema. And what you see here are a bunch of data items and instantiation of relationships. So, cats, he attended the event Google I.O. And there is partial temporal information that event was held at Moscone Center in San Francisco on this time. And that uh, he is advised by this professor and that professor directs this center, right, this, see what's happening. And this is one instantiation of relationship web. So the point here that we were making in the 2007 paper with Kartik Ramakrishnan is that think about the web you have. Underlying that all this thing what you are seeing is on the web. But by making these relationships, by using this ontology schema, you are making the things lot more understandable. Just think for a moment. All the data that is out there, that captures all these things. There is some web page on that, there will be some attendee list, there will be some photograph he has posted, there is something on his web page, or my web page saying he is my student, and whatever, right? Our mind instantaneously creates that, this, as needed. Giving machines the ability to create this is what we are talking about. And this is what doesn't even exist today that well. Right? So there is a, by understanding relationship, there is a lot more to do. Now, again, if you are working on healthcare, think about achieving this kind of stuff in that domain. Okay, we'll take a, you know, end the class today here. Anything else?